on the bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting it down to the closing bell. And here it'll take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Tim Stenevic and Carol. Oh, I'm sorry. Carol's out today. Simone Foxman in for Carol Masser. Welcome to our audiences across Bloomberg Television Radio and our partnership with uh, YouTube. Tim Stenevic, the market. Not really doing much today. No, I was thinking, you know that shruggy emoji? That's <laughs> I do. really yeah. how traders felt about the CPI report. I mean, forget talking about what's what's happening later this month. I mean, November is what, what everyone's talking about, but ev what everyone's talking about, Simone. But traders are kind of split 50-50 about whether or not the Fed is actually going to hike in November. Yeah, and the question mark as well, there's not going to be a ton of new data out between uh, their meeting next week and their meeting mm. come late October, early November. So you have one more CPI report and you have a GDP print, uh, which means there's going to be a lot of focus on a few specific numbers and then a lot of question marks, I think. And a lot of obsessing over bond yields and a lot of watching oil prices as well, which is, of course, why the headline number came in a little bit hotter than expected. Yeah, absolutely here. And you're looking at some of the numbers on your screen. We should point out relatively tight trading day here for the S&P 500. And I was looking back. This gets to we we're having a conversation on Bloomberg Television with Lizanne Saunders and Charles Schwab. This idea here that the breath that we are looking for just really hasn't been there. Except for energy, right? Every time oil prices go up, all the energy stocks move uh, up as well as a knee-jerk reaction. When oil prices go down, they all get sold off at the same time. Energy, by the way, the best performers over the past three months. Yeah, uh, we'll see uh, kind of uh, how things shake out. And I think to Simone's point, this is kind of a market, at least right now, kind of left to its own devices, at least until next Wednesday and maybe even beyond that till we get to the next earnings season. As for the price action today, a mixed bag with the Dow Jones Industrial Average looking like it's going to close out the day lower by about two-tenths of a percent roughly down about 70 points. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 moving in the opposite direction, but only modestly, higher by about five points or about a tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite higher on the day by about three tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000, that's your uh, relative underperformer of the day. It's going to close lower by about eight tenths of a percent. Now, despite the fact that the S&P 500 did close higher by more than one-tenth of one percent, Scarlett, you actually saw fewer stocks in there advance than decline. Speaks to the, of course, market cap of the mega cap tech companies that, if they're not Apple, tended to move higher today. 202 stocks in the S&P 500 moving higher, 298 today moving lower. All right, let's take a look at how the S&P 500 ended the day among its 24 industry groups. Retailers are in the lead there, up one and a half percent. That's really Amazon uh, lifting the group as a whole. Autos and components, GM, Ford, and Tesla rising, and utilities, still that defensive bent. We saw that yesterday as well. Uh, on the downside, tech hardware, that's HP and Apple dragging that group lower. Capital goods index is really 3M and Ingersoll Rand. And then you have real estate investment trust lower by eight-tenths of 1%. All right, I got some gainers for you on the day today. Uh, J.B. Hunt Transportation Services, Inc., moving higher today by more than 4%. It's the largest long-haul trucking company here in the U.S. The president of the company, Shelly Simpson, saying that the company expects expects a gradual increase of freight as retailers have worked through their excess inventories, essentially signaling an end to a U.S. cargo recession. She struck quite a different tone today at a Morgan Stanley conference, uh, the tone different from April when she said that uh, the freight industry was in recession. Also, we got to talk city shares moving higher on the day today uh, by uh, just about 1.7%. The company, as we've been speaking about throughout the program, throughout the day, preparing for a wave of job cuts. This is Jane Fraser, the company's CEO, launches the biggest restructuring of the Wall Street giant in two decades. This is all part of her effort to reverse a years-long slump in the stock prices. Stock price, the stock did move higher today, but it's down roughly 40% since she took over back in early 2021. Uh, it's more than double the decline of any major U.S. rival over that same period of time. And shares of Moderna spiking higher on the day today. The company did say that it expects to add $10 billion to $15 billion in annual sales. That's by 2028, after the launch of new products in oncology and in rare and latent diseases. The company does expect COVID-19 shot sales of $6 billion to $8 billion this year. That does depend on U.S. vaccination rates, though. The company also said a trial of its mRNA-based flu shot did meet its primary goal. 
Yeah, Tim, I've got some decliners here. There was a lot of big names that where we saw some substantial declines today. One of them was Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, this really a reaction to an effect for lots of commercial real estate brokerages, reacting to the potential for rates to be higher for longer, uh, especially to some comments from its rival CBRE at a conference today. The CFO there saying the recovery, the recovery clearly has been pushed back shares of JLL down negative seven and a half and CBRE also down 6.7. Uh, American Airlines also taking a hit from higher fuel costs, saying they will cut into profits. Uh, airlines across the board really took a hit today. Um, we saw losses. A Spirit announcing its problems with fuel costs as well. 3M, uh, its CFO was at a conference today. There's a theme here. Lots of industry conferences. The new C the, the CFO there said the new CEO, which is coming in, who came in on September 1st, is going to get more time to spin off the health care division. But markets did not love that, with shares falling about 5.7%. And then U.S. Bank Corp. We have some management commentary as well about its net interest income outlook, seeing uh, that as being worse than expected. All right, let's take a quick look at what happened in the yield space. Because, of course, when we got uh, that CPI report at 8.30 a.m. New York time, you saw a huge spike in Treasury yields. At one point, the two-year was around 5.08, but that reversed just as quickly as it happened here. And the end result here is the entire Treasury curve shifting lower on the day was most, most of the activity, of course, around uh, the Fed rate-sensitive two-year yield, which was down uh, by about four basis points on the day. Similar move for the five-year yield, while your 10-year yield only down by about three basis points, Scarlett. You know, I'm wondering what's going to happen at 5 p.m. when the president of the UAW, Sean Fain, gives his address on Facebook Live over how they're going to move forward with whether they're going to strike or not. The two sides, the automakers and the union workers, still remain pretty far apart. Yeah, we had Stuart Paul of Bloomberg Economics on our program a little earlier today, and he used that as a, he really struck a cautionary tone about things that the National Bureau of Economic Research, the NBER, they're the official body, of course, that designates whether or not we're in a recession, is going to be looking at. Um, and he included uh, concerns about uh, what happens to GDP, what happens to uh, the economy, if this strike does happen and it happens for an extended period of time, Romain. Yeah, I mean, we've had a, a, already a preview of this, of course, back with the 2019 strike and the strikes before uh, that, where we kind of know at least the dollar, the potential dollar uh, impact uh, uh, from these types of strikes. But there's a, I'm also more interested. But that one wasn't all three at the same time. No, it was not. That's a good point. Uh, and it, it, it's certainly a big deal. But the other issue here, too, is it's also about the negotiating power that they have or that, that they think they have and whether that actually can carry through mm. uh, to uh, meaningful wage gains, even if they don't get the 40 percent or 38, whatever they're asking for now, there's going to be something. And the question is, how do you absorb it? You mentioned, uh, Simone, all these conferences taking place. You've heard what those airlines were talking about. It wasn't just about jet fuel. It was about those new pilot mm -hmm. contracts and the labor costs associated with it. Well, and as well, a consumer um, that's increasingly looking for discounts, steep discounts, heightening discounts. Um, I do want to bring you a headline that we've had as well about Starbucks. Uh, which says Howard Schultz is stepping down from the company's board effective immediately. That the news out of Starbucks right now. He, uh, the former CEO, uh, Howard Schultz. Apparently, this is part of a planned transition, and uh, Starbucks has appointed Wei Zhang, who is formerly a senior advisor to Alibaba, as a director mm -hmm. starting on October 1st. Starbucks shares in the after hours down about 1.2%. This has happened before. He, he went back to the company, he went back to the board, but he stepped down from all of it before, only to come back a few years later, Romain. Yeah, absolutely. And we should point out, they have already have had a, a long-running uh, succession plan here with the new, I guess, incoming uh, CEO and, and basically uh, trying to, I guess, hand the reins over to uh, a new generation. Howard Schultz, of course, did a lot of great work there, at least in terms of creating shareholder value. I'm not sure, you know, they have quite figured out the whole drink situation there. Last time I went in there, it was just like a sea of cups. Like, what's going on? <laughs> what do, what do you mean? I, don't, I, don't, I, didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. I just walked out. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Well, it's small is not called small. You knew that, right? No, okay, I did that's not the problem. That. That's where maybe you that's why they wouldn't take my order. <laughs> <laughs> I still always order a small, small just to just because that's I can't remember what they called. get it though. You ask for small, <laughs> they, they know tall, you know, grande. I don't know. But that's another company that has labor issues. I mean, all these yeah. companies are dealing with labor issues. And, and I think about how in Hollywood has has there been any talks, any progress, any movement towards any <sighs> kind of compromise? It feels like the companies are OK with just letting the strike go on, because at, at least in the last set of earnings reports, it was helping them save money. 
Yeah, I think, you know, there are showrunners who are eager for progress here. There are various people trying to push those negotiations uh, forward. But the, a lot of the projections out there are that we're not necessarily going to see a resolution there uh, until the end of the year. And then, you know, what next? I feel like it's been one wave of labor issues after another, right? Yeah, I mean, and look, I mean, this is, we, we saw this coming, right? I mean, that's the consequence of a strong labor market. We haven't seen a market that this strong uh, probably in a couple of generations here, and I guess some of the unions are trying to take advantage of that. We saw what happened with UPS where they had to cave pretty quickly, but, I mean, how consequential is it for Ford to cave in to UAW? How consequential yeah. is it for some of these other companies to cave into their uh, union memberships? Maybe that leverage isn't quite... Uh, as levered as they thought. You know, we just spoke to Amanda Agati over at PNC, and, and she reminded us all about, I mean, some of us don't need reminding, about student loan payments actually resuming in October. And she says the market is, is really not taking seriously the economic impact that this is going to have. Consumers are already squeezed, uh, and if they're going to have to start paying these loans again come October, then that's a real issue for consumers who power this economy. Did you see what they actually did for the uh, U.S. budget, though? <laughs> The, no. a surplus in the most recent month, largely because of all those student loan payments well, are coming back in. Well, so I don't know. Maybe what's uh, bad for the economy might actually be good for uh, the imbalance uh, in our budget. Yeah, it's certainly doing yeah. some of uh, Jay Powell's work for it, uh, too, as well. Uh, that is going to do it do for Beyond the Bell. Do you think he still has his student loans? I don't think he does. No, okay. no. I, th I think he's. I think he's. You know. I think he's in the clear. I think he's. He's in the probably clear. made the prudent financial decision. I think the time of Carlisle <laughs> probably helped him. Yes. With that. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> that is going to do it for Beyond the Bell. Our cross-platform coverage of the market close right here on a Bloomberg TV and a Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg Originals and YouTube. Meantime, catch us. We'll be back tomorrow, same time and same place.